So the title for our third plenary is A Framework for Asian American Spiritual Formation. And I'm going to first introduce my co-presenter, Sharon Wada. Do you want to just maybe stand up here with me? So Sharon is... Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Sharon is co-director of Sustainable Faith, a nonprofit dedicated to fostering a culture of healthy spirituality among leaders and their communities. She is actively involved in training spiritual directors, providing resources for new expressions of Christian community and creating spaces for leaders to develop regular practices of well-being. Sharon has a master's degree in intercultural studies from Fuller Seminary. She has a particular concern for the complexities and needed contextualization inherent to the journey of leaders of color. Thank you so much. And um, she and I are going to tag team, so I'm going to go first. And you all know me. I, uh, my name is Dr. David Chow. I direct the Center for Asian American Christianity. And you're going to get to know me a little bit better in our presentation today. Because my story, I'm going to tell a little bit about my story. And both Sharon and I are going to begin our stories with the wall. This is a metaphor along the critical journey. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the wall in my life journey as we integrate my intergenerational family story with our social history as Asians in the U.S., along with our faith development. So here you will see, um, that's not me, that's my dad, and that's my mom. And this is probably 1972, soon after I was born. That is the back of my head in a baby stroller. So the fact that I was born in 1972 is pretty important because it comes after the Heart Seller Act. Um, I wanted to share this family photo because a picture uh, tells a thousand words. Um, my family, we grew up in the Chinese church. So when I lived in Buffalo, New York, the Buffalo Chinese church was our spiritual home. That's where my dad was baptized. My mom was already a Christian when she grew up in Taiwan. I am of Chinese background. My wife is of Korean background. And um, we compete about our son and his ethnic affiliation. Um, after Buffalo Chinese Christian Church, we grew up and moved to Louisville. So what church did we attend there? The Louisville Chinese Christian Church. And uh, in college, I was very actively involved with a parachurch campus ministry. And in that campus ministry, I found out that, oh, Christianity is not a religion. It's a relationship. And that was good news for me. I really got into the scriptures through Bible study with the campus staff workers and learned that salvation is by grace alone. That became part of the faith and doctrine that I learned. I also caught fire for evangelism and discipleship. The campus ministry really emphasized personal faith. It emphasized personal discipleship. I would meet weekly with a Bible study leader and a discipler, and it emphasized personal evangelism. I was very active in my faith going on short-term mission trips as a way to demonstrate to myself and to my community my commitment to Jesus Christ. Throughout it all, salvation was one of the primary theological loci or doctrines that I spent the most time thinking about my own salvation, and the salvation of those who did not yet know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I want to slow the narrative down when I graduated from college. And I went to Vancouver, and I studied at Regent College. What happened in the mid-90s, which begins to date me, um, is that my parents divorced. This was... An, um, a long time coming, there was domestic violence at home, um, a restraining order, very difficult things. And so I'm not going to get into too much detail other than to say that my world was rocked. Coupled with, um, during seminary, I started dating and I had the first romantic breakup of my very young adult life. The compounding of my parents' divorce with my romantic breakup spun me into a, a spiral, which I could not get out of. Depression, anxiety, self-questioning, lack of confidence, 
emotions that were alien to me and my faith, given my parachurch campus ministry background, that was totally externally focused. And so what um, I encountered as a wall was being socially isolated. I was the man on campus, a recognized public leader within the campus ministry on the Northeast coast to be um, in Vancouver in a different country where no one knew me and to suffer these compounding life traumas of, of, a fam of my family being broken up and my own heart being broken. And were it not for spiritual direction, therapy, I don't know how I would have survived those periods of my young 20s. And so after college, my seminary taught spiritual theology, and I had a spiritual director who allowed me, gave me theological permission to enter what Jeannie Park Hearn was describing earlier, the heart of hearts, where our lament, if unacknowledged, would fester. I actually learned that there was an entire set of Psalms called the Lament Psalms, which allow us to cry out our disappointment towards God as a legitimate part of our faith. And were it not for wise professors and spiritual direction, I would not have known this legacy within the Christian and biblical tradition that captured all of ourselves, our humanity, our emotions, our anger, our disappointment. God can handle that. And so one of the transitions that was tugging at me during seminary was this notion of my whole person. I wasn't just a brain in a vat, but I had emotions um, and that these were legitimately part of my faith formation. Now, in pastoral care class, we also learned something called Bowen theory. This is a family systems theory, which then helped me to see that I was not simply an isolated individual, but that I was part of a family system with multiple generations. And so the, the, the parental divorce that I was reflecting on, I realized why it was affecting me. And seeing this visually and to hear and understand a theory gave me some initial language for understanding how myself is embedded within a family. That was extremely powerful. I, be, I then began to replay my intergenerational family history along this family systems theory to see how, oh, the aunts and uncles relate this way. We, didn't, we never talk about this part of the family. Why is that? And so the family systems theory shows where broken relationships exist, where healthy relationships exist, and how each part of the diagram affects and impacts each other. That's the definition of a system. But I'll close on this brief note before we transition to Sharon, which is to say that as powerful as these insights were during my seminary time, when I, when I received individual spiritual direction, individual therapy, and this understanding of family systems, it was still inadequate for my own growth as an Asian American Christian. So I'll pick that up when I transition, when I speak next. But the, to close on this diagram, we're going to build out together a framework for Asian American theology and spiritual formation. And I just wanted to highlight this first circle, the circle of intergenerational family life. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of my background. So let me go to the next. Oops. There we are. Okay, so this is my family. I am third generation Japanese American. My grandparents migrated from Japan in the early 1900s. So we're talking almost 100 years ago, probably more than that, actually. My parents were born and raised in Hawaii, and we have three adult sons and a new granddaughter. So for us, that makes five generations of Wadas in the U.S. So this is kind of, my story is more of a snapshot of what it looks like to be a few generations out as an Asian American. I've spent the last six decades, which also gives you where I am age-wise, um, moving in and out of Asian social circles, and that definitely impacts my spiritual journey. Most of my young adulthood was spent in Asian Christian communities, 
And that's the space where I encountered my first wall. So the short story is by age 30, I did all the things that I thought not only a good Asian, but a good Asian Christian would do. So I completed my master's at Fuller. I had done two internships, one in the church, one in campus ministry. And my hopes for both ministry and motherhood were moving along. So we had two kids. We bought our first house. We carried the mortgage. This is all by age 30. And what I found was that I wasn't happy. I didn't have the language for it then. But now even listening this morning to the speakers, it's the model minority just imported into my Christian life. And it's not satisfying, especially for me. I'm a little on the intense side, as people around me would say. Um, also, my doctrine um, was expanding. I was exploring who is the third person of the Holy Spirit? How does he manifest? And so you've got sort of these theological issues overlaid on the internal unrest. And the questions of, is this all there is to the Christian life? And that was my first wall. So let me talk a little bit more theoretically about what is the wall. Okay, so the wall is that place where another layer of spiritual transformation can or is about to occur. Existentially, it could be your outward circumstances are trying. Um, there might be trauma, disappointments. Um, you are butting up against your own human limitations or the disappointments of being in this broken, fallen world. It could be related to a question of doctrinal beliefs. Maybe the theology or implicit or explicit that's been handed down to you, it just, it doesn't match with your lived experience. It could feel like a crisis of faith, um, spiritual boredom. And it's actually an invitation. It's an invitation to examine your inner life, to focus on God's grace and receive the healing and the formation in those more hidden places. And let me say this inner work will benefit your outer work and it allows you to emerge with greater authenticity and to be able to respond with healthier choices. So, the wall is actually part of our spiritual journey. It's integral to the development of spiritual maturity. I'm going to fast forward in my own history. So about 10 years later, I started meeting with a spiritual director and have been meeting pretty much with her for the last 20 years on a monthly basis. And as she listened to my experience and my journey, it reminded her of a publication that she recommended that describes the developmental stages of faith. And she introduced me to a book that I have held on to for the last few decades called The Critical Journey. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit about this for my spiritual director friends. It's all review. I apologize, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Um, so this book is a description of typical patterns of spiritual formation. And I think Jeannie kind of gave us a definition of what do we mean by spiritual formation. I just want to summarize that I think of it as it's the lifelong process of the Holy Spirit conforming us to the image of Christ um, for the sake of others and for our own belovedness and delight in God. It's, um, as Jeannie talked about with Dallas Willard, right? It's that process of transformation in your inmost being. And it happens over time. So what we notice is there are typical patterns of development. And these are descriptive. They're not prescriptive. But as people that are interested in cultivating spiritual health and congregations of spiritual healthy people, it helps us to get a read maybe or to get a range of where folks are. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the process and this will give you a, a visual of where I'm going. The critical journey or the stages of faith formation 
in this description by Hagberg is six stages and the wall. We're going to spend most of our attention on the wall, but I'll give you the full picture of where we're going. The stages are fluid and cumulative. One is not better than the other. You know, just think developmentally, like as a human, infancy is not better than young adulthood or vice versa. Um, and you take the lessons from each stage as you go. So they do build on each other. Each stage is important and valuable. The authors in the book created a circle um, within which God is at the center and you've got people um, in all different phases. I created this zigzag pattern just to emphasize the journey metaphor and that there's movement and it's not a straight line. So you can move back and forth between the stages and we all do. You might experience more than one stage at a time. Um, but there is somewhat of a sequence in that you start at the top and you kind of move through the progression. The first three stages um, that are listed up there are what are called the uh, outward stages or external. And David already referred to this external meaning your locus of discernment and learning is external. You are learning from the people, the community around you, and you are um, using that kind of as your starting point in trying to get a sense for what is God calling me to do and to respond. The next four stages, stages four through six, are what we call the inner stages, and here your locus has shifted to inwardly. So your locus for learning and discernment is now coming much more from within. And what is probably intuitive is there's got to be some kind of shift between the outer and the inner stages, and that's the wall. So that is why the wall cannot be avoided. All right. Let me just briefly talk about what these stages are. I, I love how David described his own journey of faith because in those early stages of commitment to Christ, learning and serving, those are the first three stages. There's some kind of awareness of a personal, yes, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, however it came. Then there's a, a season of learning about him through the scriptures, primarily through your community, and then moving on to service and outward ex uh, flow, if you will, of the first two experiences or stages of faith. Now, if you grew up in the church, those three stages tend to roughly match from childhood to young adult. It's just kind of the way um, we're formed. If you came to faith as an adult, those stages may not map so uh, time-wise in terms of your actual stages of life. Now, the stage three of the productive life, those are kind of hard to read, I apologize. This is the doing stage where you found a place to serve or multiple places. And um, there is a lot of energy in that. And you may be serving within a community with other people. You are experiencing some measure of success or um, effectiveness. And it is the place, you know, for better, for worse, our church and faith communities are built on people being in stage three because we're volunteer dependent. And so there is a give and take here, which means that movement to stage four is going to be a big transition. It's a letting go of what has been effective. And it's a moving into a place of vulnerability. And somewhere in that, you experience a wall. So you can see why the movement from the first three to the second three is not an easy transition. So where we're going to focus on today is really the wall, which I think in some ways is what Jeannie was talking about, that the movement towards grief and loss puts you at a wall. It's a movement towards whole, wholeness and holiness 
and naming and grieving our losses. Thank you, Sharon. I didn't know I was an illustration for the book. <laughs> We're going to talk about um, migration and racialization, the social history as Asians in the U.S. And I want to delve back into my own life story and, and leap forward quite a bit in my narrative to 2015. So in 2015, I attended the Asian Theological Summer Institute and was surrounded by senior Asian theological scholars who I've never met. It was my first time when I was as a doctoral student in systematic theology here at Princeton Seminary that I encountered something called Asian American theology. I was like, huh, what is that? I've heard of theology. I've even heard of black theology. I've heard of Latin American theology. I'd never heard of Asian American theology. I am Asian American. I am studying theology. Maybe this is of relevance to me. So that experience in 2015 just opened a can of worms. I'm like, does my Asian American background matter for theology and for my faith? I never had a professor of theology who was Asian American. I knew the Reformed tradition pretty darn well from Calvin onwards. Uh, most of my professors were white gentlemen, fantastic scholars. I had one or two Asian faculty, but they were usually co-teaching and they were never teaching anything specifically or contextually related to Asian churches or Asian faith formation. So a lot of questions were conjured up in 2015. And as I began to pursue my studies here at PTS, um, Isaac Kim, who's in the room somewhere, he and I created an Asian American theology reading group. We just started throwing ourselves into Asian American theology, which then led me to study Asian American studies. So I was an East Asian studies minor in college. I had read about Chinese history, sociology of Japan. I'd never studied Asian American history, sociology, literature, et cetera. And that was another kind of mind boom where my language and the concepts about migration, racialization, model minority stereotype, perpetual foreigner, these were just established tropes within the Asian American Studies Guild. I then came upon a fascinating book um, called Racial Melancholia, Racial Dissociation by Han and Eng that my students and I, we would read together as a reading group. It's not a religious book. What is fascinating about this co-authored book with a clinical psychotherapist and an Asian American studies scholars, scholar is that they integrate their two disciplines to create a framework for understanding how the inner psychic lives of Asians in the U.S are in part structured by systems of racialization in society. In other words, what goes on in the therapeutic world when we talk about our feelings and our innermost being is actually very much related to our social environments, which for Asian Americans includes, from, our, from the framework of this conference, migration and racialization. So this book helped me to see that the two were um, interestingly connected. But how is this theological? All right? Because I'm a Christian and I'm a theologian. So this is where I then began reviewing some of the patristic literature and the, and the medieval as well as reformed theological literature. So back in my MDiv days, there was this quote that I had on my study. It's by Irenaeus, and it roughly translates, a human fully alive is the glory of God. It talks about theological anthropology and our full humanity. Moreover, when you study Christology, there's something called the two natures of Christ. Christ is fully human, fully divine in one person. Without the full human nature of Christ, there would be no salvation of humanity. So I'm thinking, okay, so Jewish came in Jewish flesh. Jesus came in Jewish flesh. Does my flesh matter? Does my social form matter? And I began to think maybe it does. 
So then, then, then the question is, how does it matter? And then, being Reformed, I need to end on Calvin as my other theological example. The opening sentence of the Institutes for the Christian Religion is Calvin's uh, definition of wisdom. Wisdom, according to John Calvin, is constituted by two parts, the knowledge of God and the knowledge of self. In seminary, I had thought about this knowledge of self only individually, my kind of narrow individual self-consciousness, me, David Chow, as an individual human being. Maybe with Bowen family system theory, I would think about David Chow in his family system. But after reading the Asian American studies literature, the Asian American theological literature, I began to expand my understanding of self-knowledge to incorporate our social history as Asians in the U.S., which involves migration and racialization. Calvin's dictum of wisdom provides theological justification for the integration of our intergenerational, and I got a diagram here for the visual learners, our intergenerational family history as deeply embedded within our social history as Asians in the U.S. In other words, the entire theme of this conference is to say, we Asians have families. These families do not exist in social vacuums. They are within a society, whether in Korea, Taiwan, India, or the U.S. To understand our spiritual journey then requires facility, language, concepts generated out of this Asian migration history and subsequent racialization. Okay, so um, that sets up two parts of the three-part framework that I will continue to explicate after Sharon. Thank you, David. I, mean, I think that really hits the point of if we're going to do our wall processing to, and then move into the second half of our formation, the content for that processing has to include our context. And that is both our family context and the broader sociological context. And all of this is under God's umbrella, which David will talk about at the end. So I want to talk a little bit about my own journey and how I didn't have the framework to do the sociological um, contextualization. So my, in terms of migration, you know, as my folks' grandparents migrated around the turn of the uh, 20th century, we're talking pre-1965 act. And they came as um, farmers and... As Japanese Americans, they went through World War II, which we know was a horrendous time of um, discrimination and loss. And as part of Japanese culture, we don't talk about it for the most part. And um, we have cultural directives like Gaman, you just do what's necessary to persevere. And as we heard this morning, it serves a survival purpose. But now we're almost, you know, 100 years out from that. Um, I think it's time to take a look at it. And I just hadn't done that until probably the last 10-ish years. And actually, I was quite helped by last year's conference, um, on David's conference on Asian American mental health. And um, Jessica talked about last year, disconsciousness. And she gave the definition of it's an uncritical habit of mind that justifies iniquity and exploitation by accepting the existing order of things given. And in Japanese culture, we have um, the phrase shigatanai, which means can't be helped. You just make the most of it. And I think that's how I function. But functioning that way leads to an internal stress or, um, or unconscious anxiety. So that's running below the surface of everything. Um, now, I would say outside of the, my Asian American Christian context, I found some inner resources. And in the faith traditions that my husband and I were moving in, we pressed into uh, inner healing and focusing on developing intimacy with God. And that was super helpful. But it didn't really address the broader sociological issues. Of course, the history of migration and racialization 
And that is why I'm so grateful for ministries like the Center for Asian American Christianity, for all of you being part of that conversation. What we're doing is we're integrating what we know from family systems, from spiritual formation, development, and frameworks, and we're bringing that piece. And um, so I'm appreciative for the collaborative work. And I want to say, when we move in the Asian American space, there's so much variety and unique differences. So when did your family migrate? Well, was it after 1965 or was it before? How many generations are you? How was war in part of that? So all that we heard this morning about no one can do that inner work but you, that's the invitation. But it is an invitation that God extends with grace. Um, he's given us one another. There's a ton of resources that we, I didn't have many years ago. And the Holy Spirit works in and through it all. Wonderful. So we're going to get into some deeper theology. We're going to talk about God's economy and Asian American theology. Okay, good. So God's work in providence, justification, and sanctification as, as an example. So I just want to review where I last left off. We had our stories of intergenerational family life. We had our stories of the social experiences of Asians in the U.S. and how both of these depend on each other as part of our faith journey and theological framework as Asians in the U.S. So I do, I do think that those two those two narrative strands are significant for faith and for theology. Because if they didn't matter, think about that. We would be operating as disembodied souls, generic human beings, neither of which we are. We are uh, socially embodied in a particular form. I'm a 51-year-old, second-generation Chinese-American man. Um, and the, the motif of the incarnation and the doctrine of creation says that particularity matters. God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1 and called it good. Revelation 21 redeems that broken heaven and earth and calls it a new heaven and earth. Notice heaven and earth is um, a phrase to describe all of creation. All of creation is being redeemed. So it does matter. I want to drill down into some very specific themes that we will hear again tomorrow, especially in the race and discipleship track. My good friend and colleague, Greg Lee, along with Jen Blue and the Nagasawas, they're going to talk about very specific discipleship related issues, such as home location. Do you choose to live in the suburbs? Do you choose to live in an urban environment? Do you choose to buy a house, rent a house? These are very practical decisions that we may think operate within ourselves. These are not theological questions. These are not faith questions. I want to contest that. I think they are theological questions and faith questions. We will examine vocation, specifically what we choose to pursue as work. Think about it. from nine to five, Monday through Friday, most of us are working. Is that a theologically significant sphere of life? We want to think, yes, it actually does matter. Okay, so then how does the content of our work begin to affect or not affect the kingdom of God? We want to raise issues about and questions regarding wealth and poverty. Already we've heard in many of the stories earlier today how we have some families that grew up with wealth, some families who grew up in poverty. Migration alters all of that and reestablishes them anew in a different country with different um, cultural norms. Education, this is a big one. We've heard SCOTUS. Um, uh, question, affirmative action. Asian Americans in that debate are heavily debated. We've already heard from many narrative strands uh, earlier today how education and educational success is a high priority amongst most Asian Americans, and I am part of that narrative. I was joking with someone earlier that I have a 16-year-old son, and yes, I do, I do review SAT vocab words in the car, with him, except now we don't use notebooks. We use Quizlet on his phone. It's just part of the script. And, um, you know, it's, it is what it is, and it requires further reflection. 
which brings me to another issue called parenting. How do we parent our young people and to raise them with confidence and assurance, especially with faith, when there's so many options in the world to live without faith? And so if these issues of home location, vocation, wealth and poverty, education, and parenting, if they are not theological questions, then we are saying our, our practical existence is as atheists. Think about it. Either they are of theological significance to us, or we live as practical atheists. We cannot silo these practical uh, quotidian concerns as if they were atheological or aspiritual. And when we do, what does that say about our view of spirituality? It says it's disembodied. It says that creation, Genesis 1, didn't matter. It says that Jesus' incarnation in Jewish flesh doesn't matter. And we would like to think from a biblical perspective, a theological perspective, that's not right. And so I want to just reflect and give some examples of how three doctrines um, work within an Asian American narrative perspective. And do I have that last picture? Oh, good. Yes. So here is the three narrative strands that define Asian American theology and spiritual formation. It begins with our intergenerational family stories that are embedded within our social histories as Asians in the U.S. that feature especially migration and racialization. And from a Christian theological perspective, we confess that these two narrative strands are taken up in God's divine economy. God's works in salvation history as narrated by scripture and culminating in God's self-revelation in Jesus Christ. And so the first thing I want to say is, remember um, my doctrinal focus in college was on salvation by grace alone. That was a really powerful message. This was further emphasized as I learned about the Protestant Reformation in seminary. In Calvin's message, Martin Luther's message about sola gratia, that salvation is not by works, this is debated by Augustine and Pelagius, by Calvin and Piggius, by Luther and Erasmus. It's a huge commitment of the Protestant Reformation to emphasize this aspect of the Christian tradition, especially in Paul's letters, that we are not saved by works, but by grace. Within the Asian American context, this is like honey to a broken heart, where most of our lives we've been spent um, was over-functioning to compensate for whatever suffering our parents are going through or to perform up to the expectations of the model minority to recognize that our relationship with our Heavenly Father is not dependent on our over-functioning is radically transformative. And so there's something about, there's a reason why many Asian Americans, I think, gravitate towards Reformed or Presbyterian churches or ministries or theological frameworks, because this happens to be one aspect of the Protestant Reformation and the Christian theological tradition that makes a lot of sense to us on a plain reading of scripture and a plain reading of our own human experience as Asians. I want to um, talk about two more loci. The next is providence. You guys probably have never heard anyone talk about the doctrine of providence. The doctrine of providence is related to the doctrine of creation, which I've referenced, especially through Genesis 1. Creation and providence are usually underdeveloped within most churches that emphasize evangelism and discipleship and the doctrine of salvation. But salvation presupposes there's a creation that needs redemption. That's Genesis 1. Moreover, so much of our lives, the Monday, through Friday, um, where we're working in the world, where we have a vocation that is not full-time Christian ministry, a doctrine and theology of vocation presupposes something about creation and providence. That as God is steward of his creation, that we are partners in that stewardship. And that doctrine of vocation is embedded within a doctrine of providence. Without this broader understanding of theology beyond our individual salvation and piety, which I think are extremely important, we lose a larger Christian vision that takes seriously our social embodiment as Asians who have migrated, as well as our vocation 
and the political economics behind it. So they just want to raise the doctrine of providence and creation as really foundational for an Asian American theology. And then last, sanctification. Again, sanctification in many holiness and Methodist traditions is usually framed individually in terms of our individual relationship and transcendent relationship with the Holy Spirit, all of which is important. But should we also consider how the Spirit is at work in the world and how our vocation and our sanctification, which represents and gives witness to God's justice, not only in justification, but in the grain of the universe, all of that is part of how, how Jesus, through the Spirit, is perfecting us to represent, to witness to God's, to the kingdom of God, which is beyond simply our individual piety or our individual faith. Again, the challenge here in reimagining these Christian doctrines to a broader um, vista, a broader imagination, without which our Asian Americanness wouldn't matter, right? Because we've grounded our Asian American experience and identity within a social history. So then you have to think, either that is a secular move or that's a theological move. And what I'm saying is, no, that's a theological move. And we've got doctrines that help us to think more broadly. And the Holy Spirit is, a, is an essential doctrine, not only for a holistic anthropology, but a holistic ecclesiology. The church sits in the world. Its, its calling is to manifest the love and grace and righteousness of God in the world. Until we have a bigger imagination and vision for what the ministry of the Holy Spirit is, then we will lose, we will shrink um, the meaning and power of what God's kingdom is. All right, I probably went on a little bit longer, so I'm going to turn over the last section to Sharon. Thank you, David. I, I felt like it was important for us to hear, though, the, the uh, the theological framework. Um, I'm going to come at it more as a practitioner. So my day vocation is I'm a spiritual director. I see folks for direction. I train spiritual directors. I'm looking at spiritual practices that foster our formation. I'm coming at it from more of a practitioner standpoint. And I think it's important for us to hear the the theological framework that all of this is integrated together. And so I'm going to go back to the wall because the wall is the place where you do that integration, where you take a look at what's happening within your family, use the family systems framework. We take a look at what's happening in our spiritual formation. What are those practices and ways of connecting with God and serving alongside of him that makes sense for where I'm at? And we look at that all in our context using the three circles that uh, David had on the other slide. And in our spiritual formation workshop tomorrow, we're going to use that three circle focus to take a look at our practices both individually and as soul care providers. But I'll close with just some practicals on how to move through the wall. One, I wanna say it's the place where it, we're invited to bring our whole selves, our pain, uh, as well as the things that we do like about our lives and let God love us fully, just as we are, to show up as fully as you can I would encourage us to not be silent in our suffering. This is where our stoicism can work against us. It's not a place to just suck it up, but it's a place to lament, to be real. And secondly, it is an invitation to communal connections, especially reach out to those soul care providers. Find a good therapist, a spiritual director, um, a pastor mentor, uh, folks that you feel can be your companion on this journey. I, I loved what Jeannie said there about chalice community. I'm not exactly sure what that is. I think our home group that my husband and I are in, we're pretty close. But if you can find others that want to travel with you, it's a huge grace just to normalize the ups and downs of this journey. 
And lastly, I want to conclude with, okay, all of this is really about our spiritual formation journey, our journey of becoming more like Jesus, of, of finding that place where we are at peace with who we are, who we were created to be, who we are becoming, and the place of vocation. Where has he called us to partner with him in kingdom work in the world? That's what this is all um, leading toward. It is incarnational. We don't do it alone. We do it because of what Jesus has done and is doing. Um, and knowing that he's lived this human life from birth to 33. Okay, so one caveat, he did not go through old age and dementia, which some of us in the sandwich generation, that's a reality. But in other, every other way, he experienced all the human developmental, physical, emotional, relational challenges that we do. And beyond that, God created us. He knows. He knows what we're going through. It is holistic, and we are helped by learning from the other disciplines, whether it be psychology, sociology. David talked about Asian American studies. We have those things at our disposal. And it's meant to be empowering and sustaining. The point here is not to burn out, to flame out, to walk away disillusioned, but to press through the places of difficulty, of questions of suffering. They're very much a part of our formation, and they will be part of the stories we tell, the testimony that we pass on to generations that come after us. 